Bruno said, my name is Stein Farstol. I'm one of the co-organizers of this session. I'm a PhD student at the University of Tromsø. And the title of my talk today, as Tura said, is Archaeology and Hyper Art Wrecker Than Weird. Most of you have probably not heard about Hyper Art uh, before, but you probably encountered it, what I claim. There are weird things and structures haunting familiar landscapes and the objects we usually think we know everything about. In one way, hyper art can be described as material vestiges, things that have become detached from their intended purpose or function. After being liberated from an obvious human usefulness, their unfamiliarity and inherent weirdness, as objects can in one sense be said to be amplified. The person who invented the term, or perhaps who discovered it, is the Japanese artist and novelist Akasa Gen Akasagawa Genpei. I must excuse my pronunciation of some names and words in this text, who recently passed away in 2014. Through his eventual career, Genpei worked with avant-garde, neo-dada, and conceptual artwork, amongst other things. He noticed his first piece of hyper art in 1972, a staircase which he could not make any sense of. It led nowhere, and for some inspicable reason, the banister had recently been repaired. <laughs> the staircase was neither entertaining, useful, nor ornamental, but a pure, non-functional object. One of his descriptions of hyper art is, quote, beautiful, preserved, but ultimately useless object attached to some kind of real estate, unquote. Another name Genpei used for the hyper art is Thomasons. This name was inspired by an American baseball player, Gary Thomason, who played his two final seasons from 1981 to 82 for the Japanese team Yomuri Giants. However, after signing one of the most generous contracts in the Japanese baseball league at the time, he played miserably and almost beat the strikeout record in the league. Gentepain noticed that the name Gary Thompson, written in Japanese characters, could alternatively be read as hyper art. For Genpei, Thomasons became the perfect example of hyper art, previously financed while being utterly useless. <laughs> Thomasons go usually go unnoticed in everyday life. Their rather elusive character makes them different from ready-made objects that are made into art by moving them into a museum and given a signature, such as Marshall Duchamp famous urinal, the fountain. If you find a piece of hyper art in a gallery or a museum, it has to be there by accident and unconsciously maintained. The radical aspect of hyper art can be said to be its disconnect from any human purpose or intention. As Genpei writes, quote, a work of hyper art can have an assistant, but not a creator. Genpei saw Thomasons as delicate but obstinate things that are always threatened by education, because they're useless objects targetable renovation and other forms of clearing. For Thomasons to exist, things, architecture, or other structures must have an opportunity to grow and persist at the same time. As Genpei observed, places where both the really old and really new things mingle are fertile grinds for Thomasons, such as New York and Yokohama. Sites where weird and strange things can flower. As I said, Thomasons are familiar things that are already weird in some sense. The strangeness does not necessarily mean they, that we have noticed them or that they apparently are prominent disturbances in the environment. They can be insidious and hide in the details, almost like small puzzles one have to search after, such as doorways, pathways, or stairs leading nowhere, an overhang protecting something long gone from the rain, an empty al alcove, or a superfluous gate. Through his students and public participation, Genpei collected and documented a large amount of hyper art. The Thomasons project lasted from 1983 to 1987, and popularized the concept of Thomasons for the general Japanese public through publishing reports sent in by readers in a monthly photo magazine. A person that certainly was an inspiration for Gameplay's work is Konvajiro. Originally an ethnographer, 
that later in his academic career I spent to work with architecture design, urban planning, design, and clothing. Kohn worked, Kohn was born in 1888 and passed away in 1973. In the beginning of the 20th century, Kohn studied Minka, traditional housing and dwellings in Japan, Korea, and in, even Manchuria. In 1923, the great earthquake hit the Kanto Plains in, on the Japanese mine island Honshu, which was a catastrophe that had a great impact on Kohn's work. The great Kanto earthquake had a magnitude of approximately 7.9 and devastated both the city of Tokyo and Yokohama. In the earthquake's aftermath, Kohn conducted a phenomenological survey of the makeshift barracks and shelters built by the earthquake sur survivors which focus on themes such as fashion, architecture, property, behavior, and decoration. This, this was the start in this, of the discipline of Kogen Gaku, modernology. In English, yeah, modernology in English, which was founded by Kohn together with a friend and colleague, Yoshida Kanekichi. Kogen Gaku was a neologism where the word for archeology, span Kukugaku, had the character Ku, meaning old, ancient, replaced with the character gen, meaning the present, now, current. So, modernology could alternatively be translated as the archaeology of the present day. This word means an attempt to be subversive towards the idea that studying a material culture of the ancient past was more worthy than the everyday life in the present. Monology investigated things that could be described as trivial or ignorant in most of the acad academics in the, at the time, with an emphasis on observation, surveying the everyday life, and how things change. This was during the Meiji period of uh, change in the early 20th century Japan. There's a lot of new modernization and westernization. One of the questions Kohn examined was the unconscious behavior of people in their everyday lives. Rather than constructing elaborate theories that would, in some sense, abstract everyday life, modernology focused on the meticulous collection of data, drawing, photography, and visual descriptions. It had a multidisciplinary approach that included a methodological aspect from anthropology, botany, geography, sociology, and not at least archaeology. Kohn thought of archaeology as a methodology dealing with material remains of the past, while mod modernology is an object-oriented methodology developing an ongoing phenomenon. Kohn wrote that modernists that looked at modern things as if they were thousand years old, as curious objects. Modernology studied everything from broken, useless, and abandoned objects to the movement of ants, the cigarette steps on the streets, patterns of cracks on broken rice bowls, or the footsteps of people walking on the street. With these examples in mind, there are some interesting similarities between modernology and the development of archaeology of the contemporary world and recent past in the West. Kohn insisted that the modernists must look at the house in the village as a whole, both recent and old, not just the hatched roof house and native ethnologists would drift, would drift towards. In some sense, both cons archaeology of the present day and the Western contemporary archaeology situate themselves in the present and look at things as the, they are in the present moment. While at the same time acknowledging the past, both stresses that field work to head out, gather data, and document things in the field is what distinguishes its research from the desk-bound approach of a historian. Another similarity is modernology's focus on the small details and things in the mundane and everyday world, such as seeing broken teacups just as interesting as grand boulevards. The call for investigating everyday things are considered tri that are considered trivial and mundane, as we know, is a familiar topic in contemporary archaeology. These similarities might be just superficial, and they kind of go much more in depth because much of work, Kohn's work has not been translated to English or other language I can understand. Kohn's modernity put perhaps more emphasis on recording human behavior that changed in this present time than the, than the contemporary Western archaeologists of today. 
In the 1930s, he traveled to both Europe and America looking for some similar use in, of the name in the West, a similar field of study, but found none. I wonder what he would discover if he traveled today. Genpei Akas Akasagawa's work with Hyperart, also with an artist's land, was explicitly inspired by Convergino's modernology. Not at least because his, he and his fellow Tomosonians was mobilized while he was teaching a course in modernology at an alternative art school during a 15-year tenure. Gepe brought this in his introduction to studies of Streep's observation that they employed monologist methodology in his teaching to create the study of Thomasons. However, in my opinion, even if Gempe was conducting social critique of capitalism and consumption with his work with Thomasons, the concept of hyper art focused much more on objects themselves than the focus on human behavior in modernology. Modernology's lesson is that, was that to study the present day, the moment, the modernity, it is necessary not to look as the only at the humans, but also the things that are generally regarded as mundane and inconsequential. To search for Thomasons is perhaps necessary to employ an archaeological approach to the environment, looking beyond the everyday facades of irrelevance for the strange things they had to inhabit of surroundings. Instead of looking for the intentional and meaningful, you are rather directing your gaze at the apparently purposeless, useless, meaningless, and accidental. This is a reversal of the usual approach we usually use, which seeks to disclose or reveal the deeper meaning of things, the non-accidental. Thomasons are perhaps not only threatened by extinction by renovation, as Gempe noted, both perhaps by initiatives and research that only you look for these useful and meaningful things. The weird and strange may perhaps perceive it as something we ought to overcome and explain, a mystery waiting to be solved. What happens when the archaeologist or encounter and Thomasons? Would she or he recognize what it is or what it was? For example, look at this picture, a derelict roadside snow stake planted in the soil of an abandoned 19th century landscape garden in Norway. Why this object was moved to and planted at that exact spot is, mi is a mystery. In Norway, millions of these stakes are placed along the roads in winter as winter approaches and sub subsequently removed as the spring sets in, but some of them escape the yearly cycle. People rely on them with off without offering them a second thought a unidirectional focus on it, its past and history will overlook its strangeness, the, its present in the present day, the, the now, here in the garden. In some sense, if one focuses on the history of a thing, how it came to be, one can clearly clear away this strange present. Its unruly placement, it does not mark or delineate anything, but make itself present with this bright neon red body framed by evergreen spruce trees, raven, birch, grass, and snow. Because the roadside stake is not absentmentally taken care of by humans, it does not fit into game pace definition of hyper art. However, it's still there, presenting a stark contrast to its surrounding bracket in a derelict landscape garden, a piece of architecture and real estate. In, this, in the last chapter of Gempe's book, Hyper Art Thomasons, he points out that Thomasons are not inherently urban phenomena, but that they can, well, can as well be found in the countryside and the wilderness. <clears throat> One of the hyper art reports Gempe received from the countryside contained pictures of an abandoned railway which displayed Thomason like qualities, even when it was no longer, no longer maintained in the pristine condition. This legend of Thomasons as Gempe calls them, a completely retired like the baseball player Gary Thomason, but they are still a part of the environment. Archaeological Thomasons, which Gempe is uncertain in, are instances of hyper art, is in my opinion retaining the weirdness because they still are objects, things that exist in the world. Gempe struggles to see them as Thomasons because they are utterly abandoned by humans, the unconscious assistants. An abandoned railroad track cutting through the rice paddies 
only persist because of its materiality and the plants and weeds which stabilize the earth and abandonment. Non humans which have no sense of meaning, usefulness, or any consciousness we recognize. The perfect harpy artists. In one way, we can think that many archaeological storehouses and heritage sites are filled to brim with Thomasons. Artifacts are neither ornamental, useful, or raising an interest, carefully taken bare care of people, machines, and architecture that don't offer them much of thought. Even if they stand in the reserve as from a Heideggerian perspective, they are rich in a moment of meaningless and weirdness, sustained by the hope that might in the future disclose something meaningful. If I were to regard, disregard apparent, all the apparently meaningless objects in my investigation of the derelict landscape garden that I mentioned, I would probably have to clear up where most of the material exists in the garden today. From a documentation of the garden that includes thousands of images, audio recordings, page, pages of field notes, only a minuscule amount of objects will be visible or fully utilized when the research finishes. The leftovers, more than just potentially meaningful data, are perhaps Thomasons in their own sense, store and archive that when the end unused and useless. There is perhaps something unintentional artistic hyper-artistic in the endeavors that perpetually collects and store things and information. Walter Benjamin's observations on how collectors liberate things from the drudgery of being useful resonate in a strange way with Game Pace's idea that bringing object the art out of the museum into the everyday world to liberate them from us and ourselves, letting the materiality be. For Graham Harmon, an American philosopher known for his object-oriented ontology, the interesting things about art, but not exclusively belonging to it, is its production of allure. Rather superficially explained, allure is something that comes to awareness in the forms of surprise or fascination, wonder, because we are not sure what we're dealing with, even if we witness the object's qualities. Among the things that produ produce allure in Heideggerian times is term is the strife between the earth and the world, between what, what it is and how it appears to us. Allure brings into the attention the hidden objects and their visible qualities. So the fascinating enchantment of artworks is the tension between the withdrawn objects and the essential qualities we experience. Is the special status Hermann gives to the art with this weird allure, something that's also true for hyperart Thomasons. In my opinion, the tension which the resides between what things represent and what they are might be encountered in objects that can be described as unintentional Thomasons hyperart. As Gamper writes, wonder, quote, I wonder if the whole world isn't just one big Thomason, unquote. <laughs> hyperart is one way to conceptualize the weirdness and the familiarity of things. However, it can also help create a yet another constraining categories where we put things, try to describe them by terms of you know, upkeep, taking care of how things are. Nevertheless, the concept opens for perspectives, a material, material mediation that alludes to the informality and weirdness of things without immediately resorting to clarifying explanations. Thank you.